Next up, speaking of agriculture leaders and women who are able to really change the way that the industry is being shaped. It's going to be my pleasure to welcome the Dean of the College of ACES or the College of Agriculture more simply, although it's really not limited to just agriculture. Today, we'll probably highlight all the advances they have in that space. Uh, Dean Kidwell is a true uh, leader in thinking about student experiential learning, translational research, how industry can work more closely with the university in shaping new facilities, new capabilities, and innovation. She is a strong proponent of the land-grant institution, and she has a number of uh, points of recognition in her own research. She was named a Crop Science Society American Fellow fellow as a developer of 20 wheat varieties. She's a respected scholar and she's an award-winning teacher. She's wonderful to work with students and with companies. And she is going to talk to you more about Growmark. And we're really excited to have the CEO of Growmark joining us today, who she will introduce. Thanks, Dean Kidwell. Hello, welcome everybody. Good morning. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to have an opportunity to talk with Jim Spradling today. Uh, the CEO of Growmark. Uh, Jim and I have known each other for a while. And Jim, I apologize. This is a fireside chat without a fireplace. <laughs> Don't worry. I came into the office today and left my fireplace, uh, but I'm really, really happy to have this opportunity to chat with you. So, you know, I thought we might start out by letting you talk a little bit about your background and how it fits so seamlessly well with what Growmark is doing, the products and services you provide. So please tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got on this journey. Well, thank you, Kim, and thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to uh, participate in this simulated fireside chat with you this morning. And maybe I should just, if I could just briefly, I'll tell a little bit about Growmark too along the way. Um, you know, I consider Growmark a 94-year-old startup company, and, and that's really simply because we're striving to constantly improve and evolve our capabilities and our value proposition. By structure, we're a regional cooperative. Uh, we do do business across all of the lower, lower 48 U.S. states and in two provinces of Canada. We own the, Grow, we own the FS brand. We provide products and, and services in agronomy and in energy, grain marketing. We have a commercial construction business and we're really foundational to us. And I, I wanna make this point clear that, you know, our, what's foundational to us is offering our customers trusted expertise, uh, providing excellence in service, uh, being leaders in technology and, and lending risk management advice. Um, we do own a couple other companies that I thought worth mentioning. Uh, we own Seedway, which is a company headquartered in Hall, New York. Uh, we're the largest uh, vegetable seed distributor across North America. And we own two thirds of Allied Seed, which is headquartered in Boise, Idaho, and uh, is a forage seed company. Uh, our, our structure is very integrated with a mix of owned operations and, and member operations. Our retail network of some seven, 800 locations is a combination of, of, of member and Growmark owned locations. We're all on common IT platforms and have a common business model. There's about 8,000 employees across our system in total. And, you know, when you get to uh, my career, I, I am in my 10th, uh, now in the Growmark system. I, I've spent approximately half of my 38 year career on the FS side of our business. I have transferred twice between FS and Growmark, FS and Growmark throughout my career. I've, hit, I've enjoyed experiences uh, starting out in uh, accounting. I'm actually, my degree is actually in economics and business administration, but was able to start out in accounting. I've held marketing roles and management roles, having managed two different FS companies in, in my career. At Growmark, I, I served as a region manager, and then I led our wholesale energy business for four years before I led our wholesale agronomy business for eight years. And so now I'm in my seventh year as CEO. So 
I have had the have the benefit. I have had the benefit of tremendous uh, experiences across our system, and I try to maintain those perspectives every day in, in my role as CEO. That's fabulous. You know, I think you tell a really great story of, of how many pathways there are to a, a career in agriculture in the food system. So a lot of people think if they don't come directly off a farm, if they don't have a degree in an ag-related field, that there's no place for them there. But your story would say uh, that's not the case. So lots of pathways through accounting, computer science, a lot of allied industries that support ag. So you're a role model and inspiration to a lot of youngsters. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, you know, we really can't have a, a, a meaningful conversation these days without talking about the impact of the pandemic on, on your business and your industry. And, you know, in my realm, we talk a lot about not going back to the way things were, but thinking about what we've learned over the past year that allows us to do some things differently and perhaps better than we did before. And there is a deep yearning for, you know, the things we absolutely want to do the way we did them uh, before we were in this situation. Can you tell us a little bit about how the pandemic has impacted Growmark, especially around your digital, digital transformation strategy uh, in light of where we started and where we are now and where you think you're gonna go next? Sure, sure. I, I really like your, and applaud your approach to think about what we can do better uh, going forward because we can learn from, all learn from the experiences that we've had in the last year. Uh, for Growmark, the transitional experience was uh, you know, unique and, and similar yet to, to others. Uh, at the beginning of 2020, we were very fortunate to have concluded a five year long conversion to a new ERP system. So we were fortunate to have that behind us. That conversion was uh, all in all a very good experience for us. I will say it was always intense and occasionally painful, but um, it enabled us to have a good outcome throughout last year and to build, and it's given us a great platform to build from. Uh, we, we went to work from home over a 48 hour period in March of last year. We established, you know, the safety protocols for the, the vast number of employees in our system who work on the front lines, what I will call the front lines in retail, face to face with customers at facilities. And, um, the combination of employees who really stepped up both at our locations and working from home, along with a new ERP, state of the art ERP system is really what enabled us to serve our customers because we were right on the cusp of our busiest time of year. In fact, uh, I think um, our, our farmer friends in the conference would remember that the second week of April was one big, huge farming week for across the Midwest last year. And in fact, we set, Growmark set product movement and transportation records, not one day in that week, but four consecutive days in a row. And, you know, I just couldn't have imagined that we could have done that with corporate employees working from home, with retail employees working under strict safety protocols, but people did it and people stepped up. When I think about um, our digital transformation journey, I mean, you know, we've been on one for now for several years and, and we're fairly well digitized. Um, I will say like others, the pandemic did focus and accelerate our effort though. And when I think about big initiatives and I can sure elaborate on these maybe later if we get to, to supply chain, but we're, we're working on um, efforts to strengthen our supply chain responsiveness and efficiency. We're using Lean Six Sigma uh, process improvement to enhance our customer satisfaction and the profitability of our organization. And, and we're also, I think much like Shannon mentioned, uh, tapping into cleaner um, real-time data and trying to gain insights uh, through data analytics. So beyond that, we're, we're really focused on it innovation in our organization. And we're taking an approach to, it's a problem solving approach to that. Looking, always looking for continuous improvement. Um, we're exploring game changing ideas. Uh, we've successfully integrated robotic process automation in, in, in spots of our business, which has been very beneficial. And when we talk about, I think a new better and the future of our digital transformation strategy, I mean, we firmly believe that Growmark's future is as 
and omni-channel organization. And so we're launching several uh, customer-facing, farmer-facing applications that'll hopefully enable an easy and very beneficial customer experience with our organization. Fabulous. So there's the industry side of the digital transformation that helps you do all the things you do. There's how that impacts growers in their industries. You know, are, what are you guys doing or thinking about or talking about that's supporting that translation to you know growers and how they get the maximum benefit from the technology? So, so many of our growers, producers, farmers, they, they use and rely on a variety of applications that they personally appreciate in their respective operations. I mean, that's a given. You know, the growers may use the Deer app, a climate app, DTN. I mean, there's a variety of FS applications that hopefully many, many growers use or accounting applications. The thing about it is all of these applications, what we've learned is that they're, they're typically in disparate locations and they have different login information. Mm -hmm. So the way we're approaching this for the growers benefit is, and the problem we're trying to solve is how to make this easy and convenient. And, and we've recently launched and or we're about integrating and uh, today what we call the MyFS Solution Center which is really a, a gateway, a digital customer connection that enables um, easy access to information whenever, wherever, however, a grower wants to use it with a single sign-on and the ability to toggle between these applications that are favorites for growers. That, that doesn't mean that our focus uh, it won't remain on customer interactions and, and trusted advisors. Uh, um, that's an embodiment of our core value. So we're, we're not replacing the people component with this strategy, but what we're trying to do is enhance the customer experience with, with ready access to information. So the MyFS uh, Solution Center for us allows us to bring in best in class tools that may be developed by either current or future partners to our business. Something that we don't, you know, as opposed to Growmark building all of our own applications and saying you need to use just ours. Through API connections, we can integrate information between these applications in collaborative ways. And, you know, an example I think of is perhaps a grower loads their planning dates into one application well, that can populate other applications instead of re-entering that, you know, into each application. And there's a startup company called Leaf that we're working very closely with and, and that enables us to move data easily between these applications. Beyond that, for a grower's benefit in the MyFS Solution Center, you can make payments, you know, you can access your statements, your transactions, the splits, you can even get your field boundary information, you can calculate costs per field, you know, in the future, I will say. Um, so there's just a ton of things that we're planning to build out. We have the architecture uh, that's going to enable us to build this out further and one of the things that we think about that differentiates us, maybe makes us unique, is that we serve our customers, our growers, with agronomy, energy, uh, grain marketing, a variety of services, risk management services, uh, some lending. And MyFS Solution Center on the digital side of our business can be a highly beneficial one-stop resource for those growers. So. We're, we're using customer councils right now, frankly, as we speak to uh, for new development ideas and with an ultimate goal to deliver uh, the best user experience possible for our customers. You know, there are a couple of things you said I really love. One is one sign-in, right? People had to just scream for joy there because it's complicated to remember all your user IDs and all your passwords. I struggle with this myself and in other accounts. So that's really exciting. I think the other thing that really intrigues me is not reinventing the wheel, using technology that other people have created. You know, I, I say this often, if we could reveal all the solutions each of us had, we could probably take on the big problems if we work together more. So I commend you for accessing, you know, Thank things you. that other people have done instead of doing it yourself. 
good, good grow mark. Well, thank you. We do think about every dollar we spend is a farmer's dollar, and why duplicate that spend when you don't have to? Yeah, that's fabulous. So, Jim, you mentioned a little earlier supply chain, and you know we've seen uh, uh, amazing reveals, of course, over the last year about supply chain issues. Would you expand on that a little bit? Uh, how has the pandemic actually really impacted some of the supply chain issues that are really directed to what you do in Promark? And as we move forward, are there big adjustments you see coming as a result of what we've learned? Yeah, yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> yeah, let, let, me, uh, let me talk a little bit. I, I, I think I can talk about supply chain in three buckets. I want Let me start with packaged goods because I, I think uh, it's an interesting story for us. Uh, we did not experience any major product disruptions throughout the pandemic in our packaged goods distribution, but uh, we did experience a what I would consider a low level of aggressive product stocking, but but it did not cause any major disruptions. What made us very nervous, I will tell you, last April, May, was that we're structured with what I would describe as a smallish network of super large distribution centers. Just in Alpha, Illinois, we have uh, a strong six acres under one roof. So there is a lot of product at this particular location. And we're, we're, we, we have been set up for decades in a hub and spoke model that's, that's worked well, but we thought proved to be vulnerable during COVID-19 because what if the crew all went down at Alpha and we would have been in a tough spot. Of course, we instituted the safety precautions and combined with I don't know how better to describe it, but great behavior on the part of our employees. You know, we dodged a bullet. We navigated any issues, but but we did think that we need to address this and we need to change as a result of what we learned. And um, so we went about immediately last summer reimagining our network of distribution centers and, and, and we re reimagined them into smaller distribution centers which are configured in three hour travel radiuses mm -hmm. so that we're a little bit less vulnerable. And, and I will tell you that led to the addition of several new locations just since last summer in mm -hmm. our network. We've leased a number of locations. We have some new construction going on um, so that we've got this bigger, broader footprint of distribution centers, not so reliant on the big hub locations. Mm -hmm. And we believe if we manage this well, that it'll build extra resiliency, it'll reduce our transportation costs, it'll provide better, all, better overall service while reducing the concentration of inventory at any one location. Sure, sure. Beyond, beyond that, um, you know, beyond the physical structure and the packaged goods piece, I mean, our future management will involve what I think of as more advanced sales and operational planning as well. We'll use technology to align our customers across our footprint uh, to specific distribution centers and, and we'll build routes accordingly. We have software that enables us to do that. We're planning to deploy uh, more robotics technology in our warehouses. We'll rely on data to assist us in performing, you know, in optimal levels. What's the amount of inventory needed, where, when, and Etc. across our network. So the Lean Six Sigma flows back into this process of constant improvement and uh, to be more responsive and more efficient. So that's kind of packaged goods for us, which is a lot. And then another story in supply chain for us that was, was significant is our energy business. Mm -hmm. Refined fuels, particularly diesel, we found that we had a bigger supply disruption much later than what we anticipated. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was, there was refined fuels everywhere and it was cheap because consumer travel had declined. Mm -hmm. But the longer the pandemic went, the more refiners rebalanced their production down to say 80, 85% of capacity. And that ended up as demand picked up, particularly on the diesel side. Think about all of the online ordering and things that generated truck movement. It created some overall supply issues, particularly 
a variety of local availability issues in distillates or diesel in particular. And we're big users of diesel. We're big shippers on pipelines. And the thing about pipelines and how product moves is it requires gas to move product through the system. Gas tends to push diesel through the pipeline system. And uh, without gas demand, they, pipelines just weren't moving stuff. And so product got out of location. It was made worse by the hurricanes. And it was also made worse by refiners taking advantage of the uh, reduced demand to do turnarounds and maintenance on their facilities. So we got by and through that successfully, but I will tell you it wasn't without some long, long hauls of product to make sure our customer demands for, were met. So in the future, we're going to look, you know, study even more closely. I think we felt like we did before, but we'll study more closely our supply plans. Uh, we'll look to try to proactively create velocity at terminals that enables new product to come in. And uh, we'll make sure that we're communicating uh, constantly with our customers about dislocations or outages. So that's kind of the energy piece of our supply chain. And then the last piece I might mention is transportation. And frankly, truck demand increased after an initial slowdown, it, it moved back up. Um, the channels and lanes kind of, and volumes kind of changed, but demand for space and drivers was as strong in recent months as it was before the pandemic. So we're thinking we got to be more flexible, more smaller warehouses. We got to launch great technology tools to keep our customers well informed. We got to be very methodical in our sales and operations planning. And uh, we'll use Lean Six Sigma data analytics to do that. I like to mention the, the one thing I certainly don't want our organization to be guilty of is this concept of uh, this war concept, victory disease. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't feel like we were prepared for the pandemic, but we successfully navigated it. But that doesn't mean that we'll success be successful in the next issue. Every year, every pandemic is going to be different. And so we don't want to get caught in that. Uh, just because it went well, we want to make sure that uh, we're prepared. Yeah, it's interesting. So there was the initial shock at the pandemic and things that happened over time that revealed challenges. You know, one of the things you said that really resonated with me was, was kind of going away from that uh, wheel and spoke concept to, you know, developing more um, smaller, more regional distribution pieces. How, do you think that might resurrect some of our rural communities in a different way? You know, uh, we went to we went to some bigger distribution areas because it was more cost effective and efficient. Do you see a resurgence perhaps in rural communities? Well, I, I think I can tell you for a fact that that it will in certain cases. I mean, these are even a smaller distribution center than six acres is not going to be a small distribution center. But I will tell you, I, I can I'm thinking right now the location in Kentucky where we've where we're adding a warehouse and then it, it's in a small community mm -hmm. because it was a great logistical, a great geographical uh, location for a, from a logistical standpoint. And so I think, yes, it, it, it can. It certainly can. Interesting ray of hope. And <laughs> yeah. a lot of people would say is really one of the most difficult experiences of our, our lifetimes for sure. So uh, I'm going to encourage people to uh, put some questions in, in the chat. Um, you know, if you don't mind, Jim, there's one in there now that sure. if you're willing, I'm going to fire at you here. Uh, the question is, do you see the role of a precision tech specialist transitioning and becoming the crop specialist of the future? Um, with a caveat, focus more on technology and innovation rather than price solely. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. That, that's an, a, a very applicable question to um, our thinking today. Uh, just, just this past year, we added for the first time in our agronomic services team at Growmark, which, which lends support to, I think, what's a network of around 600 agronomists in, in our, across our footprint. There's an agronomic services team here at Growmark that lends support to them. And for the first time, we have a title of virtual agronomist. 
and and mm -hmm. and we really believe that that is our future where you know we're we're going to have more virtual agronomists that serve growers in different ways but lend support to agronomists that are face to face with our growers and i think it will change in in much the way i think that was described in the question you asked me i i think that's firmly a direction that we are headed you know, we've talked a lot about training virtual agronomists here too, and, and even in our extension system, looking for people that have those data analytics, data interpretation skills, because many farmers tell us, I, I don't need more data. I need to figure out what to do with the data that I have. You know, so I, I think that is expanding in real time in a way that there's almost a sense of urgency about it because we're living it right now. Exactly. It, it's one thing to sort organize and collect data and it's a whole nother skill set to generate those insights that become a value yeah absolutely absolutely um you know so i i talk a lot in fact i picked this up from laura you know the theme of this particular uh summit to me is the art of what's possible right i think we've learned a lot uh from the pandemic so much of, of what happened i i heard this many many times oh we can't do that we could never do that you know that will never work we can't do that online we can't we can't we can't Suddenly we had to, and we did. We just had to do it, and we did. Right. When, when you think about Gromark modernizing, you know, into the future and kind of really living into the art of what's possible, what's your big dream of, of where you might position yourselves next? Well, I will tell you, this really leads me to the uh, role I think that startups play in our organization. Um, our exposure to startups has been very beneficial. And um, thinking that I might get to relay this story this morning, I asked permission to say a couple names here. I, it, it was in 2017 that um, uh, Matt Bell, who you may know and many in this audience may know, who was a partner with a, a venture capital firm called Cotivian Sandbox at the time, and by the way, was a former FS precision farming agronomist in the Gromark system who knew us well, approached us and said, you know, I think Gromark could be of a big benefit to startups and testing their ideas, adding, lending some advice, and simultaneous to that, Gromark could reap benefits from investments in these companies and access to those ideas. And so we studied that and it wasn't long before we were strategic limited partners with Coltivian Sandbox. And I will tell you, I have nothing but a great admiration for Coltivian Sandbox, their team, the rigorous evaluation process, the rich evaluation process that they go through and Gromark's involvement in their advisory council the, all of these things combined have just opened up this big, broad universe of startup companies to us, which um, in, in a huge way. And so, and back in, again, back in 2017, we dedicated two leads from the Gromark team to collaborate with Cultivian Sandbox, and we were simply off to the races. And over the next year or so, I mean, Gromark's team alone met with over 150 startup companies. And so we found that we were having all these ideas. We saw it as our future. You know, you talk about the art of the possible and our, how we see our future. We see, saw this as mission critical to our future. And so, but we were getting overrun with uh, contacts. And so what we created then in 29 was the process we call ag validity, which is a way, it's a methodic, methodical process for us to either choose to take a new idea into a test and trial or determine that idea is just not a fit for us, you know, at least at this time. So since 2019 then, ag validity has become a recognized name and it has further expanded the network of startups that we're associated with. In 2020, just by way of example, we took, we worked with 30 startup companies on 90 infield trials. And those were adjacent to, I think we have a my, what we call my field product testing trials, and there's over 850 of those. But these 90 trials were dedicated to the work of 30 startup companies. 
you know, since we've been a limited partner with with Cultivian, uh, we've established other relationships with several other VCs, which has been beneficial as well. And and what we're doing now is we realize that ag validity has you know, benefited us from a first mover advantage, the opportunity to influence these new ideas as they come to us from the startups. Um, and we also know, and I'll boast about this because I'm not involved, but we know our team gives solid advice too. And our testing is really rich across our system with a big footprint and a big network. And so we've helped them develop their business as well. In fact, there's a couple examples where we really believe we've helped startups monetize their business and the sale to larger companies. So when I'm trying to get this all toward how we see our future is, um, you know, we're in the midst of launching what we call Growmark Ventures, which will be our own vehicle to invest in certain ideas ourselves that we see will be beneficial to our system. Um, we're still considering whether we want to structure that as an LP or not, but our objective will be simple. It, it, it's to make opportunistic investments in emerging technologies that, you know, that we see as advantageous to our future. So that's a long way of saying, I think we see this innovation space work with startups um, as both exciting, mutually beneficial, and a path to continued growth and investments in our future. That's fabulous. I know this was probably music to a lot of people's ears on this call that are entrepreneurial in spirit and innovative uh, in, uh, in heart as well. So a couple of questions in the Q&A for you. Uh, the first one is, uh, you talk about the importance of working with startups. What is the importance uh, that you see in working with universities? Yeah, similar. I, I, I think uh, we're for, we're, the University of Illinois in particular is so close to us and so respected and so rich in talent that, you know, I, we certainly want the kind of connections that are valuable to both of us, uh, both of us going forward. We do have, you know, connections with other universities around the Midwest, as you'd expect, um, which are valuable as well, but no, uh, equally important is working with the universities in ways that we can benefit uh, mutually. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't put that question in there myself. <laughs> but, but it fits. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would be best not to thank uh, you and Gromark for all that you've done to support students, you know, through internships and scholarships and, um, you know, coming onto campus and, and participating in classes, you know, that real interface with the next generation is really important. And so we're grateful to you. Well, thank you, we're thank you. We, we want all of the U of I graduates that we can handle that yeah. basis. <laughs> um, we have another question in the, the chat. Uh, how does Growmark work to help farmers reduce nutrients in ground and stream water? Yeah, we have, well, I mean, the, the, this whole stewardship question is, is foundational to our organization as well. And we've got, you know, we've got 600 plus agronomists and this team of uh, agronomic services here in our headquarters that are, you know, dedicated to training, uh, to educating our folks, you know, to give that trusted advice that, that, that does support managing um, the environment in all of the best ways. I mean, from a regulatory standpoint, you know, we, we so very much favor voluntary actions that are just the right thing to do, as opposed to being regulated with the cost associated with that into doing those activities. And so we have a variety of tools across our system from education to pledges that we all make across our network that are dedicated to good stewardship, good water management steward uh, along the way. Very good. I appreciate that very much. We, we can kind of ran the gamut of opportunities across the Q&A that we've had here. I see one more. Um, let me see. Last question we'll probably get to before closing comments. Um, how do you encourage innovation in your organization? Do you have any team solely dedicated to that? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a whole interesting story too in itself. We, we actually did, we, we have our own center of innovation and we created a center of innovation council and, and it got us launched into this concept of both constant improvement 
and game-changing ideas. And frankly, it, it got off the round, ground well, and we called it the most aspirational of our goals is to become more innovative. And you know how it evolved is um, we found that we were starting to turn to just that team for our innovation. But yet innovation comes from every single person across our organization. And so what we've done now is we, we've tried to, we're trying to alter the culture just a bit to where we're, we're saying it's the responsibility of all of us. Now we still have the center of innovation. We still have the regular meetings. We have our own um, Shark Tank-like setup where we have ideas that come to us. A couple of years ago, we had like 110 ideas that came in and we filtered them down to an elite eight. And then we invested in a final four. We've dedicated a certain percentage of our income to innovation and new ideas every year that are developed by our employees. And so we, we went from centering it into this, this, uh, uh, this smaller group to expanding it back to, out to, to every, everywhere. And it's no longer, we're, we're making an assumptive close here across our organization. Innovation is no longer an aspiration. It's who we are, it's what we do. Uh, we've we've evolved and innovated for 94 years and now granted it's a bit on steroids right now um, but we'll continue to do that through every every corner of our system going forward well we're going to end this where we started you you started by saying you're a 94 year old startup company and we ended with saying you're a 94 year four year old startup company so. that's it i'm telling you that is it exactly that's it exactly <laughs> Absolutely. Jim, thanks so much for your time. This was a lovely conversation. I actually learned a lot myself too. So we appreciate you sharing your wisdom and expertise with us. Well, thank you. It was an honor. Thank you thanks so much. Laura, back to you. Well, thank you, Dean Kidwell. And thanks, Jim and Gromark for being a part of our discussion today, telling us more about supply chain and very excited for the launch of Gromark Ventures. As you heard him describe, this will be a way that they can invest in startup companies. They've already been a good partner to some of our own startups here from Champaign-Urbana. So please follow up with Gromark if you want to learn more.